So single cell proteomics methods stand poised to illuminate um, cellular heterogeneity in primary cell samples as well as complex tissue samples. And as was discussed this morning, uh, such a powerful tool was enabled by a number of advances in low volume sample handling, peptide separation and ionization, as well as increases in throughput, which were enabled by chromatographic and chemical methods. Across his career, our next speaker has delivered advances in all of these categories. And he's well known for developing the Autopots and Nanopots platforms, uh, and has recently demonstrated the analysis of 200 single cells in a single day via label-free methods, which was driven in part by uh, using a two-column chromatographic platform. So I'd like to welcome to the stage today, Professor Ryan Kelly. Thank you. Okay, I probably should have some way of controlling the slides. There we go. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you guys for, for uh, the organizing this, Nikolai, and, and thank you, Gray, for the introduction. Yeah, I'll be talking mostly about analytical advances for, for single cell proteomics. I, I, um, and two, three weeks ago, I went to Belgium for a protein analysis conference, and I caught two things there, COVID and this quote. So um, I like this quote. So um, I, I like it even more than getting COVID. So, um, so this is a quote that somebody had there, um, but it's originally from the co-founder and head of Google Brain, Andrew Ng. He said, when a system isn't performing well, many teams instinctually try to improve the code. In my world, I think data analysis, but for many practical applications, it's more effective instead to focus on improving the data. So that's a lot of what our research group uh, focuses on. Of course, it's really an all of the above approach, right? Um, but, and one of the beauties of working in single cell proteomics at this point is is at least for single cell global proteomics, there's really maybe only four things we care about, right? Sensitivity or coverage. It's important, the more proteins we, we can quantify, the, we don't know which ones are important until we, until we uh, analyze them, right? Uh, throughput, right? That's kind of like money. We could all increase throughput by buying 20 mass spectrometers, but that's not a very cost-effective way of, of, of doing it. Uh, quantitative accuracy is absolutely critical. And then accessibility. And the way we try to improve each of these areas is um, making improvements across the workflow, sample preparation, separations, mass spectrometry acquisition, and data analysis. And so I'll be kind of stepping through some of these today. So um, <clears throat> kind of our entry into the, the area of single cell proteomics was with um, uh, sample preparation, right? And uh, we we recognize that you know the the standard way of doing things with a pipetter and a and a well plate, um, you know you've got a large surface area uh, leading to protein and peptide adsorption. You have uh, in a large volumes and with Michaelis Menten kinetics that can that can uh, uh, lead to inefficient digestion. And then if you have multiple transfer steps, those losses can multiply. Uh, but there are a lot of good things about this general format too, in that the sample preparation is done in parallel. You can process a lot of samples. We take that for granted now, but coming from a microfluidics world where I was you know, having these closed microfluidic circuits to prepare one sample, and then you have to throw it away, is not good, right? So, so we like that about um, single cell pro or about this format. It's readily automated. It's compatible with fluorescence because it's open. Fluorescence activated cell sorting, laser microdissection, and now uh, other approaches like the selenium are compatible. The cell in one are compatible with that. So our approach was basically to take this and just move it to a miniaturized platform, keeping the benefits, but reducing surface exposure volumes and doing a one pot preparation. Interestingly, we're kind of slowly maybe moving back to this for a lot of things. So, and I'll talk about that. Um, so we call this nanopots, 
we don't really want to talk about nanopods. It's so 2018, right? So, so, um, but it, it, it was how we got started. And nanopods took the heroic efforts of Ying Zhu to develop this nanopipetting robot to be able to dispense and manipulate these, these low nanoliter volumes. And now there's a commercial option, right? The Selenian, uh, they actually nano, uh, license nanopods and they um, have this, this workflow that, uh, that allows you to do nanoliter dispensing and it's contactless. So you don't have to worry about carryover at all. So that's, that's a nice thing. Um, one of the ways that we are using the Selenian, which I'm not sure there would be any other way, or the Selen one from Selenian, I'm not sure there would be any other way to, to do these preps is to, um, so we're, we're always thinking, you know, how can we increase throughput? One of the ways you can do that is combining isobaric labeling with non-isobaric labeling. So this gets us just with uh, SILAC, two, uh, so, so heavy and light versions uh, of cells, and then um, going to TMT label, each version of that gets you to, you know, oops, 32 plex or so. Um, and there are a lot of other ways you could do this. You could just analyze TMT Pro and TMT 11 plex together, uh, or you could do oxygen 018 lab labeling for one batch. Um, so because this is kind of dependent on cell culture to, to, for this proof of concept. But what we did is, is we used Ying Zhu's nested nano wells approach, but instead of you know, a few samples in here, now we have you know, I think 32 wells in there. And the Selenian uh, platform has such excellent spatial positioning that we can put, even though the outer diameter there is maybe two millimeters or something, and each one of those is a couple hundred microns, um, we can do that with the, with the, the cell in one. And you can see on the uh, one, two, three, four, five, about nine by three, so 27, 32 plex sets on a microscope slide. And um, we do lose a little bit of coverage going from the SILAC plus TMT Pro versus TMT Pro uh, alone, uh, but it's, it's pretty small. So, so we were not too upset about that. And then if we look here, um, I don't know why our coverage is so low when we're in, in analyzing uh, TMT sets without a carrier channel. Because um, it's a lot higher than that when we're just analyzing a single cell label free. But basically, we needed the carrier channel to get reasonable coverage. This was with 60 minute gradients, got us a throughput of around 300 cells per day. And down here, um, uh, going to 90 minute gradients with the same. Um, 10 nanogram carrier channel gets us a little bit higher. The thing I like about this uh, that makes me think, okay, maybe this wasn't just for fun, but maybe this, this approach actually has legs is how nicely these four cell types overlay with the SILAC and the non-SILAC versions of, of um, each of those cell types. Um, that's with some uh, normalization. Thank you to the Slavov group for, for helping us uh, do that. And anyway, so that was really helpful. I think the Selenian platform is really helpful for, for these nested nano well approaches or the proteo chip or NPOP where you really want to pool, have those, those prepared samples very close together. So you can just grab them and dump them into the auto sampler altogether. If you're doing label free, you know, we recognize that the nanopots wasn't the most accessible thing uh, to a lot of groups, uh, this is kind of before the people were using the selenium. Um, so we upscaled things to a few microliters. And I think Andrew already talked about this. So I'll, I'll go quickly because we have so much other good stuff to talk about. But uh, basically, yeah, this was using the OpenTron's OT2 liquid handling robot, just cost $5,000. So it's pretty reasonable. And in terms of coverage, kind of an apples to apples comparison, um, we were seeing about 24% lower coverage for um, auto pots prepared 
samples relative to nanopots. And so, you know, you have to decide, is that worth it to you? Um, uh, we're, we're typically pushing for more coverage, um, so we don't want to give up anything. And recently, we've been kind of improving the auto pots. Part of it was that these well plates that we were using to characterize the dispensing accuracy and all of that, they were these transparent bottom ones so we could do fluorescence measurements with them. Those aren't actually the best for, um, and by that, by the way, I think that should be like 0.01% DDM. Don't put 1% DDM. <laughs> That's a typo. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, you'll, you'll never see the end of it. Um, so what we're doing recently is kind of compressing, skipping, reduction, alkylation. And actually, since our our DDM lysis, that's 70 degrees C for an hour, coincides perfectly with Promega's rapid trypsin uh, digestion. They recommend 70 degrees C for one hour. And we said, okay, well, let's do, just do those together. So now it's just not only one pot, but it's one step prep that we're doing. Um, and we're using a, a polypropylene PCR plate, which, which helps. And now, you know, we're getting similar coverage. We, we have to do things a little bit more carefully and systematically to know exactly what's, what's the most, uh, what's the best um, kind of cocktail mixture that we can find and what's the best substrate and all of that. But at least when it works, it works pretty well. So <laughs> when it doesn't, it doesn't. So, um, okay, so that's kind of some of our sample prep. Uh, and now getting into separations. So uh, Andrew gave an awesome talk earlier today. Um, uh, and so, uh, but, but basically, well, I, I, the slides are already here, so we just gotta go through them, right? So, so high peak capacity separations, you know, um, that, that takes some of the heavy lifting away from the mass spectrometer, right? So, so that's, that's a good thing. It reduces ionization suppression because you're not co-eluting things that can suppress each other in the electrospray source. And you're taking the same sample. If you squish it into a narrower peak, that peak is more intense, right? So it's, it's especially a nice thing for, for a single cell measurements, right? And that's just some, some work uh, that Carl, Carl's group did about 11 years ago, uh, showing you know all else considered, high peak ca capacity separations are good. And now why low flow separations? And I know this is a lot of redundant from, from Andrew, Andrew's talk. Uh, so uh, Suchi in my group was actually characterizing these emitters that, that we, we edge that work well at very low flow rates. And, um, but, but if you look at how much signal you get in the mass spectrometer versus how much sample you put in. So this ion utilization efficiency, think about it as mass spec signal per analyte molecule. If we go from your typical flow rate of around 300 nanoliters per minute down to 20 nanoliters per minute, we get about 10x signal gain, okay? And, um, and that's, that's useful. Whether it's worth it for everybody, you know, we, we, we have to pick our battles. Um, it certainly is not 10x more proteome coverage, right? It's more like 2x proteome coverage uh, enhancement that we get by, by doing that. Um, but these, these uh, high performance separations, they give us really uh, nice in-depth analyses. This is with a 0.2 nanogram, sort of our single cell sized aliquot of the pure HeLa digest. You can see with this 23 minute active elution window, our peaks are about five seconds wide at half height. And this is with a 30 centimeter long, 20 micron inner diameter column packed with uh, Dr. Mesh 1.9 micron particles. And you can see, so this is looking at MS2 spectra, about 11,000 spectra, about 8,000 PSMs. Some of those are probably redundant, so about 6,000 peptides and 1,500 proteins. All right, and we'll, we'll be talking about 
acquisition methods to improve that. So why would we not want to pursue low flow separations? Well, if you look at this, we have a 23 minute active, active, active acquisition window, right? Active elution window, but there's about 50 minutes outside here and here that are devoted to sample loading, column equilibration, and regeneration. And that is with a trap column, right? So there's a lot of overhead. That overhead increases as your flows decrease because there are certain volumes that just take a while to clear going through valves and things like that. So, um, so I would say there are good gains to be had, but big challenges. And this just kind of illustrates the useful time versus the not useful time. Since our mass spectrometers are depreciating at a rate of hundreds of dollars per day, if you do the math, it's a little depressing. Uh, we, we would rather they, they spend their, their lives eluding peptides rather than waiting for a column to equilibrate, right? And then uh, troubleshooting can be difficult at these ultra low flow rates because just one leak is really hard to find, things like that, right? So. Um, one way that uh, people have dealt with some of this stuff, uh, or, or I should say we're, we're borrowing these uh, stored storage loops to address this to some extent. Um, this is uh, Jim Jorgensen was generating gradients at low pressure and then switching uh, to just an air amplifier pump to generate really high pressures to elute through these crazy columns, you know, like 40,000 PSI that he, he was doing. EvoSEP is also doing these um, storage loops followed by um, isocratic elution. And so, um, so it's kind of separating gradient generation with the high pressure column elution. And one good thing about that is most of your LC system is not at high pressure. It's just, just the final parts. Um, so we're reducing those high pressure connections. Um, one other way to increase throughput is to run your, uh, your other steps, your overhead steps at a high flow and then run your column, your gradient at a low flow. But here's why I hate that. It's because you get worse separations at these low pressures, right? Uh, pressure is sort of the currency uh, of a separation. So if you have a pump that can do 1500 bar, you could have an amazing column, an amazing separation that operated at that. But instead, you're just using that to clear your volumes and then you drop way back down. So I, that's not the approach I like. What we are doing is a, a multi-column approach. And, and this is actually, a next generation from what we published recently in analytical chemistry that had, um, we had two columns with two separate trap columns. And so there, there were some robustness, robustness issues because if something went wrong, you're like, is it this column or this column or that column, that column or that column? And so we, um, we, we think this is a little bit better approach. So we are filling a sample loop with straight from a nano well or a well plate. And then um, we can be uh, pushing a sample from the SPE, eluding it with the gradient behind it to a storage loop. And so while we're filling this one, we're eluding peptides through this one. So there's really four things going on at the same time here. We can be regenerating one column, while we're eluding peptides through another column, while, while we're getting the next sample queued up, and while we're loading the uh, uh, third sample plus washes into the storage loop. So this is kind of showing once you get things rolling, you've got all three, three samples doing something at the same time. And so, um, so now this is showing, you know, this is 30, 30 minute gradient every 30 minutes, right? And, um, you know, one cell after another. Uh, this was all data we were scrambling to grab right before ASMS. So, so it's a little, um, I think we, we left it running the whole week while we were gone. So there should be many, many more of these, but, uh, but that's what we had at the time. So, um, so that's kind of what we've been working on in sample prep and separation. And now I think, uh, a lot of the exciting 
uh, advances that we're gonna see moving forward have to do with you know, novel acquisition methods, novel workflows and experimental designs, and data analysis. And so, um, so just to sort of set this up, for single cells, we need longer injection times, right, to build up a sufficient ion population to make a, a good measurement, right? Uh, that leads to fewer MS2 spectra per unit time. But if we're going slower with a, with a quadrupole Orbi trap type instrument, if we're going slower with our ion accumulation, we might as well run the Orbi trap in a higher resolution setting, right? Otherwise, it's just going to be sitting there uh, collecting a fast, low resolution spectrum and then just waiting. So we might as well run that. Uh, in a higher resolution mode. So that gives us room to resolve multiple peptides in an MS2 spectrum. Uh, and right as we're thinking about this, Thermo was like, hey, do you want to play with our Proteome Discoverer 3.0 with the Chimeris uh, engine in it? It's really good at uh, resolving chimeric spectra. So multiple peptides in a single MS2 spectrum. You're co-fragmenting here, and, um, and that's what it's for. So we said, okay, yeah, let's, let's do that. And by the way, all of these are done with our 20 micron column, that, all of that. So, so this is with a 40 minute active elution window. We weren't multiplexing the LC at this point, so there was a delay in between each one. Um, but you can see this is how many MS2 spectra we acquire. What you're seeing down here is our isolation window. You know, it's usually 0.7 Thompson or 1.6 Thompson for global proteomic. And we, we said, uh, well, let's go up and up and up and up. And, and then let's also play with resolution. So 54 millisecond acquisition time with a 30,000 uh, resolution at M over Z 200 uh, um, on the Orbi trap, or we can go a little bit longer and a little bit higher resolution. Um, of course, as we go slower, we get fewer MS2 spectra, right? But the peptide spectrum matches are uh, not necessarily limited by, by that. So, so you can see we're actually in many cases uh, obtaining more PSMs than MS2 spectra. And in fact, 30,000 PSMs in a 40 minute acquisition window is just crazy. Unfortunately, because we're just blindly, we're just doing DDA with fat windows, a lot of those PSMs overlap. They were, we already got them in other ones, right? So, so this is not where we want to end up eventually. It would be much more efficient if we were doing more of a multi-notch synchronous precursor selection than just these fat windows, but that's, uh, we're working on that, right? Um, and then if we look at the unique peptides, you can see, you know, the resolution, sorry, it got blacked out here, but from low resolution, fast to high resolution, slow, we have these kind of optimums in, in the middle, right? About 10, 8 to 18 uh, Thompson uh, window is where they're, they're pretty happy in there. And if we look at our high confidence master proteins, that's 1% FDR, and MS2 identification only. We get up over 2,000 in some cases. Again, we see these nice happy mediums uh, in the middle there. And it's surprisingly flat, you know, from here, the, the middle of those three. But the thing is, once we throw in match between runs, it basically completely levels out. So, so there's still some power to the MS2 or, or MS1 level feature identifications. This is not FDR controlled. We didn't haven't played with with Fragger yet, which is FDR controlled, um, or ion quant in Fragger, right? Um, but it is very strict. So we we set a matching tolerance of just four seconds in elution time and, uh, and one PPM in uh, MS1 uh, mass accuracy. So, and one thing that's nice is that our blank 
is very low. There's like, you know, less than eight, about 80 proteins identified. They're essentially all from the match between runs, but it's very low compared to, you know, so we, we've done things the wrong way with match between runs where we're like, oh, we, our coverage increased by 700 proteins, but our coverage of our blank also increased by 700 proteins. So that's not real, right? Um, so this is what it looks like, just picking kind of the middle uh, conditions here. I think it's this condition and just running replicates. Um, you can see our, our peptide coverage is really quite amazing, right? And, and mind you, this is not single cells. This is 0.2 nanogram aliquots of HeLa digest and 0.2. So this is from Thermo and this is 0.2 nanogram uh, aliquots of K562 digest from Pierce. And this is for a 23 minute acquisition or elution window. And this is for a 40 minute elution window. Um, and then what we see, uh, again, same conditions, you know, well over 3,000 uh, proteins under these conditions. Um, and we only lose 10% when we go to the about half, uh, half as fast or, you know, twice as fast. Um, so that's cool. And then, um, of course, we, we also want to have good quantification accuracy. That's, that's the whole point, right? Um, and so this is what I, I found, you know, bear in mind, these are technical replicas. It's the same sample run over and over again, right? So these are not single cells, but that's what we want to know. What's, a, what's my technical uh, variability so that then when I see 20, 30%, I know, oh, that's actually biological. It's not just from artifacts from the measurement. But if you look at this without any normalization applied, just filtering out, of course, contaminants and proteins with, with more than 30% missing values, it's about 2%. So incredibly reproducible, um, label-free quantification. And a little bit better with out match between runs than with match between runs, but still incredibly low. And what we're looking at here is HeLa 23 minute elution with and without match between runs, then 40 minutes, then K562, and then uh, with 23 minutes and 40 minutes. All right. And then label free quantification. This is requiring two or more unique peptides, no contaminants or proteins with, you know, more than 30% missing values. That's kind of what we see. So in some cases, and really not much benefit from, uh, anyway, so no match between runs with match between runs. And then um, uh, plotting these on the PCA plot, again, no, no normalization, just with, with uh, some known nearest neighbors imputation. But look at this. So this is your, this is your 20, uh, so yeah. So these are your fast HeLa and K562, and these are your slow HeLa and K562, right? And so they just, you know, very tightly cluster. So, so I think the, the technical, uh, reproducibility is getting uh, really good, and you know the the different cell types explain most of the variation there. That's all good to see. Now the obvious question, I know it's coming from Nikolai, so I just had to get out in front of it, right? Well, well you know you're starting to get similar to DIA, right? And at least for us, we have a lot of you know, I showed all those runs from the DDA, the, the fat DDA, broadband DDA. Um, we have similar runs for the DIA, but we haven't analyzed those. We're sort of newbies with DIA. But this is just what, um, in one condition, we have more, more conditions going up to, um, you know, up to 100. Thompson isolation window down to 12. So that's kind of where the, the range we played with. In this case, this is giving us four scan, MS2 scans per peak. And that may be why it's a little bit less, the, the CVs are a little bit bigger, right? If you miss the peak, you know, that's gonna lead to some variability. But um, looks like our coverage 
under this condition is, is about 83% what we see relative to broadband. And um, 70, here we have 75% uh, uh, median CV lower than, or CVs lower than 10% versus all but about 10 lower than 10% with the broadband DDA. So we're just kind of exploring at this point, but it looks, it looks uh, promising. So to wrap up, We've seen some advances in sample prep, separations, mass spec acquisition, and data analysis for single cells and other low input samples. I think as a community, we're seeing things get increasingly robust. You know, five years ago, it was like, is this real at all? You know, nobody questions that anymore. And now we're just seeing things get more robust quantitative and easy to perform. We've shown hyperplexing is uh, providing a throughput the way we were doing it of about 300 cells per day. And then more, you know, good coverage from single cell equivalents label free with a 20, 23 uh, minute elution window. And with that, I wanted to uh, Thank the people that do all the work. Got a great group going at, at BYU where I've been for the last four years. Uh, still great collaborations going on with, with PNNL. And then uh, wanted to thank Thermo. They've been good to work with um, uh, on a couple of collaborations and then support from NIH uh, Biogen. I didn't show that collaboration and BYU. Thank you guys for your attention. And I wanted to also plug that we've got a single cell mass spectrometry workshop uh, in the fall at Asilomar, which is one of the coolest places. And, and so the, the, the difference here is that it's covering um, single cell mass spectrometry. So we're getting some imaging and lipids and metabolites as well. So anyway, so. What do we got? So I'd like to welcome some questions from the live audience first. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just stating your name uh, before you ask your question for the YouTube audience. Sure. So I'm Erwin School from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, thanks for a beautiful talk. I think you keep Thank pushing you. the boundaries of everything we do. And it's fantastic to see. Thank you. Um, I'm very curious about the SILAC TMT multiplexing and how much missing values you're expecting or experiencing there. Yeah, so we're, there we're still, we know, we know. Yeah, we need to look at that. I'm just curious. I, I, they, they, they do increase, but it's, it's kind of like the coverage decreases, but not that much, you know, 10-ish percent. That's kind of what we were seeing with the missing values too. So, but yeah, there are going to be some increase in missing values, so. Yeah, because yeah. I noticed on the Eclipse software with the standard SILAC, it will allow you to exclude the other SILAC pair and maybe you can flip it to make yeah. sure it also Make, make sure those. it grabs it, yeah. So I guess here's my question for you, okay. Uh, <laughs> so does it know, once it gets one, does it know if that was the heavy or light? Because you don't want it to blindly search for the light thinking it was the heavy you know what i mean yeah, so that yeah. would be that would be wasteful but i'm real -time not sure search. <clears throat> we should what, real time search on real time search yeah 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 okay that'll do it okay yeah we need to we need we'll, to we'll talk okay Sounds beautiful good. thanks thank you Alexander Ivanov, uh, Northeastern. Great talk, Ryan. Great uh, to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, can you please provide more information about your optim optimization steps in um, uh, increasing the performance of matching between runs? So, you mentioned these weird issues where you start seeing hundreds of features uh, uh, identified in your blank runs. How do you control for false uh, identifications, quantitations by uh, decreasing the PPMs, mass accuracy, retention times? And have you figured out the, a reliable way to apply measure between runs without uh, bringing any concerns? That's a great question. So rule number one, if you're using Proteome Discoverer, do not use auto. Okay, you have to define your settings because 
it gets a little squirrely there if you use their auto. They're like, we think we know what what to do, and then we see all this garbage in the blanks, right? So, so that's that's rule number one. Um, then, you know, the other things I would suggest what what we we do look at the blank, but then also uh, the MS Fragger now actually has um, FDR control for match between runs. So we need to work with that. For us, we were just like, well, let's just be super strict and and then, and then hope for the best, you know. So we don't have an FDR associated with with those, but it's should be pretty reasonable. And then the the last thing is you can you can search against a mixed proteome, right? With with yeast or um, uh, or E. coli or something, and see how many of those match between runs hits hit the E. coli proteome, which they shouldn't, right? So that that's another good way of of sort of QCing match between runs. So and keep your mass tolerance and uh, retention time tolerance low as well. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. If you go if you go big enough, you'll you'll get just garbage, right? Because obviously, you know, these these did not elute at the same time. But if we give a big enough window, or they're they're not the same peptide, but we gave too big of a uh, a mass tolerance, then then it gets bad, right? So Thanks. yeah. So so the defaults are like points in in max quant, the defaults are like 0.7 minutes and Five ppm or something like that. Does anybody know? So, so we just were like, well, we're just going to be way more conservative than that and call it good. And you can also see when your your match between runs starts to drop off a cliff, where you're excluding things um, that you're you're getting rid of a lot of good matches if you go too tight, like 0 0.01 ppm, right? So if I, I want to make a comment, I agree with everything that Ryan said. I just have uh, another thing that I would like to add, because I think matching between runs clearly has good potential to increase coverage, but it also has a great danger of, of making mistakes. And one additional thing that I think is very useful for us to do and to accept as a standard in the community is to prepare experimental samples in which in some samples we have proteomes of two species, in another sample we have only from one species. And then you use those for estimate the false discovery rate. Because if you're searching a blank, you don't have ions of any types, or you have very low level of ions of any type. So you're not going to get as many false positives as you can get if you actually search a sample that has a complete proteome. So I think the false identifications, and I think that what Ryan is doing is rigorous and he tries to be stringent, but the false identifications that we get in an empty sample are actually underestimating the actual number of false identifications that we can have in a sample with a complex proteome. And I think that's that's a very important issue for us to, to control. Uh, we, we think a lot on the on, along the lines of how do we make our identifications rigorous in the context of match between runs. Another thing that I think is very helpful is to also use MS2 level information for um, for making for estimating the confidence. Yeah, sorry for that. Just wanted to. No, make no, this it's it, it's very well taken, and I, I was gonna say like, you know, go back a few years, and and you know, a lot of your MS two based is taking your accurate mass and your fragment spectrum, and it's ignoring elution time completely, and match between runs has been taking your your accurate elution time and accurate MS1 and ignoring, you know, there's no fragmentation spectrum. We're starting to see more blending of those two, getting the information. Alexi, did you have something to say? Uh, I was just going to comment in that um, all our strategies not to apply any uh, thresholds for retention time difference or MOZ, but really computing the score. And that then goes to the statistical analysis to figure out the false discovery rate from MBR, right? Instead of, because you don't know what MOZ tolerance or retention time to apply until you sort of let the model to, to yeah, model the yeah. data. Right. Um, and the second point, um, I was going to, I mean, your idea of generating these two organism data sets, would it be possible to generate single cell data mixing, say, yeast and 
uh, or E. coli in human, where somehow you will try to generate, I guess, um, you know, in one experiment in a way, you know, different organisms, and then you start doing match between runs, or you know, because you gotta generate some realistic data sets in this scenario, right? Like just testing yeah, on bulk, it's, especially with like aliquoted data. Yeah, I think there's a lot of right. value. We, we went through all these exercises with conventional bulk sort of DIA data, so there is, but, but I'm, I'm not sure how that would translate to testing single set data. Right, it would be interesting to think about that. Uh, I guess, uh, great talk and, uh, yeah. Andrew Duke, I guess, from the Slab Up Lab, um, for the hyperplexed, uh, I guess one other option you could also try and Gray is to didn't suggest, but you could also try to prioritize max quant live strategies. Um, and that maybe will allow you to have a better chance of sampling both, uh, heavy and light isotopes. Um, but there's no, is, is, has anybody set up max quant live for the tribrids? <laughs> oh, maybe not. So maybe I'm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With the with the. It, it, it should work. I, we don't have experience in our group with it, but in I, I just want somebody else to break their instrument, <laughs> 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 and then and then tell me the pitfalls, right? Uh, so yeah. So so, and I should say it was just. I think everything else we showed in here was with the Orvi Trap Explorus 480, just, um, but, the, but the TMT stuff was done with the Eclipse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then yeah. the, uh, for the CV and the reproducibility measurements that they look like really nice and also could uh, be interesting to show similar plots for, to the extent that peptides might be independent measurements, um, showing like correlations between different peptides and. Uh, the kind of variability for peptides coming from the same protein, which I actually know looks also awesome in your data. Having so, um, so I guess can it's tough. Explain that a little bit more. Just so it, for I guess uh, with the technical replicates, I guess it's yeah. uh, not uh, sure, yeah. as amenable since it's the same sample. But for the individual single cells, looking at things like uh, correlating peptides that uh, come from the same protein across the different single cells can give the added yeah, layer of, right. uh, in addition to like the CVs, the technical CVs, it can give you some sense for accuracy. Um, and I guess having looked at some of this in your data looks quite awesome. So it, it's, uh, could be also. You have looked more than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll just so, go. So I wonder if it's because you saw how many PSNs we have but they're redundant. I wonder if that's kind of oversampling and, and giving additional kind of multiple measurements of the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. But we need to compare that more with other, you know, the standard DDA, for example. So we, we, we're, we're in process, right? Yeah, yeah. I just didn't want you guys to see the same old boring stuff. So it will show unpublished half-baked stuff instead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. I was wondering, you showed some results from 0.2 nanogram from Digest. Uh, do you know what would be the results if you start from N5 proteins of the same amount, and then the results if you start from the cell? So if we the start- The same amount, but the, 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 point, the starting point is the, it's not the same. So the result that you showed is directly the, the 0 0.2 nanogram of yeah. Digest of protein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you do exactly the same by starting by the N5 protein, so you digest it, and so you start by 0.2 oh, with protein, and yeah. then if you start by the entire cell, but the same amount, what is the impact of the final results and the, and the, the quality? Yeah, of the so, so one thing that I'm, we're, we're getting, ramping up for the actual single cell experience, experiments with this. One issue, because single cell samples are dirtier, right? There's more junk in those samples that we may fill the trap f faster than here. We, we are never filling the trap. We set the AGC to 1,000%. And even though we have these fat windows, we, we're timing out 
every time. But if we have more garbage, we're gonna fill the trap sooner. So that could be something that negatively impacts that. But 0.2 nanograms is pretty close to say a HeLa cell. Um, maybe plus or minus in terms of coverage, plus or minus, um, you know, or I would say minus 50% or 30%, something like that. Um, and then for, so, so especially with sample prep, it'd be awesome to have like a, a lysate standard that we could compare different digestion methods with, but all of the commercial lysates that you, that, that are out there, they're not clean, right? They, they are like, yeah, we have some SDS in here and this and that. And so, so we can't use those, but it would be great to have, uh, so that way, you know, just like we can analyze the exact same sample, look at the analytical side, it'd be great to look at the exact same sample for kind of the digestion side, but we don't have that.